All right. So we'll do this decently in an order. So by a raise of hands, if I don't get to you, we'll try to take our time. This will be a little different because of the fact that we want it to be not just answering a question, but if God leads him to kind of teach on the subject of whatever we ask, then we'll kind of pause and let him finish through with that. So who has the first question? Brother Mike. What about Satan in reference to music? To music? To music. Boy, now there's Deuteronomy 29, 29 answers most questions. It goes like this. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but the things which are revealed belong unto us and our children forever. And everything is revealed that God wants us to know. Now, Satan was a musician. He was a first one. I mean, he was, he was known for the flute. And uh, we kind of have to be careful <laughs> with our music because sometimes, you know, Satan gets an influence too and we don't realize it. Did you know the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians that the devil has churches and preachers and they're called preachers of righteousness? But their agenda is completely different than ours. But it's in the Bible. Things God wants us to know are in the book. But there's some things that are secret. We just kind of have to figure out ourselves. Let me make a little statement concerning the election. Put yourself in God's shoes and see whether you decide that America should be judged or that God should show grace. I've been preaching a long time. I remember when I used to have a lot of people saved in every service. I remember my own church. A year went by with people saved every Sunday. Not a dry Sunday. Big a crowd on Sunday nights so we had Sunday morning. What happens to the Sunday night Christian? Now, you imagine God looking down at all Christians all over the world. Is he pleased with the way they're going? Now, remember, he's got to make a judgment. You can look back in the book and see how he did it with Israel. Israel sinned, and God punished them. That's judgment. Israel returned to God, and God blessed them. That's grace. So take it from God's view. Whatever happens, God's getting ready to do something. It's either grace or judgment. Next question. Yes, Miss Nancy. A war before Armageddon. Yeah, World War III. Okay, that's found in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, 38, and 39. Chapter 37, verse 22 says, Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will gather the children from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and bring them into their own lands on the mountains of Israel. One king shall be king to them all, neither shall they be divided into two nations any more at all. Now, that's a very important prophecy in the Bible. Israel became a divided nation when Solomon died. His son, Rehoboam, became king. He was a bad one. Jeroboam became king of ten of the tribes. They had a civil war, and Israel was divided. 721 B.C., Sennacherib came down and took all of Israel, that's the ten tribes, that followed Jeroboam into Assyrian captivity and they were sold all over the world. Never to be heard from again. All records destroyed. The other two tribes lasted until 606 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar went down, destroyed the temple, took the golden vessels, brought people into Babylon. They were there for 70 years. It was prophesied. Jeremiah 25, 14 talked about it. It happened. It was God's judgment. And so as we look back now on this war in 39, they've become a nation. We watched it 
May the 14th, 1948, Israel was recognized by the United Nations. Now the Lord said in Luke 21, verse 24, He said Israel would be trodden under, or Jerusalem would be trodden underfoot. The Jews would be scattered among all the nations until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Well, on June the 8th, 1967, Moshe Dayan took the city of Jerusalem. Now, on May the 14th, it became a nation, but they didn't have the city. But on June the 8th, 1967, Moshe Dayan, that famous general, took that city. The fact is, the story goes around that Golda Meir, or, or that one of our senators, asked Golda Meir if they could uh, trade a couple of our generals for Moshe Dayan. And she said, why, sure, if I get to choose the generals. And the story goes, she says, I want General Electric and General Motors. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you come to the next chapter, chapter number 38, you'll find a group of nations. Verse number 5, chapter 38, tells about a group that are going to come down against Israel. This group is led by Persia. Who is Persia today? Iran. Iran. They are not Arabs, they're Persians. And they're going to lead an army down against Israel. Chapter 39, we find the war. Not a lot about it. But it says it's going to take the Jews seven months to bury the dead bodies. And it says in chapter 39, to cleanse the land. Something's wrong with those bodies. There's a war coming. In chapter number 38, God says, I'm going to send a fire on Magog and among those that dwell carelessly in the isles. That might refer to the United States because we're out of Great Britain. And that was the only island nation in the Roman Empire. And so there is that possibility. But we're going to have some sort of a conflict that's going to be terrible, terrible, terrible. It's, going, it's not Armageddon. It takes place on the mountains of Israel. Five-sixths of the invading army is going to die. It takes seven months to bury them. Now, the battle of Armageddon is in a valley. It ends the tribulation period, so that war has to come before. Can't you see the war clouds gathering with ISIS and all of that? Amen. We've given Iran practically the atomic weapon. Well, it may be a little while, but they already have chemical weapons. What could happen? What could cause a scene like that? What if they fired a, a, a missile at uh, Israel? Israel has the dome. They can shoot them down. And that, is, that, that uh, particular missile is a germ-generated mass destruction bomb. And it goes off over their own troops. Maybe a malfunction, or maybe Israel shoots it down. But God's going to take care of that war, just like God's going to take care of this election. He just has a way of doing things. But you read those chapters, 37, 38, 39, you'll find the gathering of the army. God says, I'm going to put hooks in their jaws and hold them back. They're going to come from the north. That's exactly where Persia is in relationship to Israel. So it's getting close. Something could happen in just a little bit. Now, let me give you one scene that could happen. <clears throat> Somebody might blow up the Dome of the Rock. You've been there, haven't you? In Israel. That's the second most, oh, what's the word I want to use? Uh, more sacred to, to Islam. Uh, second to Mecca in Saudi Arabia is that Dome of the Rock with that golden dome right in the middle of the city of Jerusalem. Now, the Arabs have control of it right now. The Jews won't go up on it because they're afraid they might walk on the place where the Holy of Holies was. So Jews will not go up on the mount. And they have the mount. Now, what if they decide to blow it up themselves to get a war started? You see, in Islam, they believe that the 12th Eman is coming back in the midst of a great war. And they want a great war. So we got something in the making right now. Wow. Have you ever heard of the, the Battle of Himagon? 
Boy. Have you ever heard of the battle of Himagog? Iman. What's the battle? That's Himagog. Himagog. No, I haven't heard that. I know uh, this one preacher that's on TV. He always talks about. <coughs> It's supposed to be a real, uh, real big battle between all the countries. Huh. Yeah. He said it's discussed on TV, a big battle between all the countries. A battle between all the countries? Yeah. Well, I think we're going to have a battle between all those countries over in, in the Middle East yeah, the and preacher, even in Europe. The preacher's name is John Hagee. John, John Hagee. Yeah. 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 He's a pretty good preacher, but there's some things... For example, he thinks this world is going to be renovated. And the Bible says in the book of uh, the Revelation, chapter 20, the great white throne judgment. After this, I saw a great white throne in him that sat upon it, from whose face the earth and the, uh, the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. Six verses later, you find this. After this, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. So this world is not going to be regenerated. We're going to have something brand new. Not, no what, no hand-me-downs. <laughs> I, I, I'm kind of wanting to spin off the hymn of John. I, the first question I had, actually I only had one, but when he spun off something that he said, can you hear me all right, sir? I'll, I'll repeat okay. you. Right. Yeah. First of all, uh, I'm a numbers guy. I like numbers. I recently learned through the great generation from those born between 26 and 46, that 65% of that gen, those Christians, we're talking about Christians now, 65% of them believed in absolute truth. From 46, from 46 to 62, that number dropped down to 50%. From 62 to 84, it dropped down to uh, uh, 16%. Now the millennials, it's a term I'm not familiar with. I just heard it like the last five or six years. <laughs> millennials, the millennials now, less than 4% of them believe in absolute truth. Where does this take, where does this take the body of Christ in terms of longevity? Okay. Now the Lord was saying some strange things to the disciples. One day they saw him seated on the side of the mountain and decided to ask him some questions. Now you'll find it in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, verse number 1. He's at the temple and he tells them there'll not be one stone left standing on the other. That's a sign. Now they came up to him privately. said, when is it going to happen? And Jesus answered and said unto them, and he gave them ten prophecies. I had somebody in the church tell me they looked up the ten that I preached on, and sure enough, there they were. <laughs> <laughs> All of those prophecies have been fulfilled in the life of one generation. Now, at the end of his message to the disciples, he said, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender, put the forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, you, when you see all these things come to pass, know that it is near, even at the door. Verily I say unto you, this generation will not pass away till all be fulfilled. The question is, how long is a generation? I love numbers myself. Now, what about a generation? Matthew 1.17 says, all the generation from Abraham unto David are 14 generations. That's 70 years. From David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. From the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. The shortest is 43. The average is 51. The longest is 70. Now, numbers. If we knew when to start with the fulfillment of prophecy, the rebirth of Israel, for example, could be a good place. And we knew how long a generation was, we know how much time we have left. Well, let's think about some generations. Now in Psalms, chapter, uh, Psalm 90, verse 10, says that we have three score and ten. That's 70 years in the Old Testament, 70 years in the New Testament. Well, let's start with the destruction or with the rebirth of Israel. 
everything is already used up. Nineteen years later, the city of Jerusalem was taken, and the Lord has said Israel would be scattered, and the city of Jerusalem trodden underfoot until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That happened on June the 8th, 1967. Now we start there, we find we have just a little bit of time. But maybe there are other generations. How long is a generation? Well, in Psalm 90.10, it says, an 80 if by a reason of strength. So it could get up to 80 right there in that one verse. In the book of Genesis, chapter 15, verse 13, it talks about the 400 years that they were going to be in Egyptian captivity or under bondage. Two verses later, verse 15, it says, In the fourth generation will I take you out. Now that generation could be a hundred years. Now, we could even start back at when Israel became a nation and we've still got a little time if we use that one. But we'll start in 1948 when they took the city of Jerusalem. I think that's the key because the Lord said it. Now, when it happens, well, the Lord says, No man knoweth the day or the hour, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. That's, that's Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. And there are a lot of things that we cannot know. We cannot know the length of that generation for sure. We cannot know the starting point for sure. But if, it, if when the city of Jerusalem was taken over by the Jews, the times of the Gentiles came to an end. Now, there's a very interesting thing, and a lot of people don't know this, that when the rapture takes place, all the, all the Jews are going to be saved. Romans chapter 10, verse 25, 10 or 11, one of the two chapters, verse 25, anyhow. And it talks, when the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, so then all Israel shall be saved. You read the rest of the context, and you'll find out that's the covenant that God has with Israel. Now think about it. The question is, we're going to rule for a thousand years over the saints of the tribulation period. How do they get saved? There are no Christians. The Holy Spirit's gone. How about Israel? Out of Israel, God's going to choose 144,000 evangelists. One from every, 12,000 from every tribe. There's 7 million over there right now, and none of them know what tribe they're from. But let me tell you, God does, and he's brought them back. And things are getting close. So my advice is, and it's in the Bible, look up, for behold, your redemption draweth nigh. All right, Pastor. <laughs> I got a question, Tony. How did he know that my next question was going to be, all the Jews going to be saved? That was, I want to know that. I want to know that. <laughs> That's, uh, That's all in God's divine providence. I don't know anything. <laughs> Way back there. My question has to do with the book of life and then in Revelation. And this question was asked of me, and I do quite know how to answer it. In the, the, the fact that we are saved and that our names will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Uh, but then the, there is the scripture about uh, the name being blotted out of the Book of Life. And we know that once we accept the Lord that we are saved, do I have that wrong or I'm sure I do? Yeah. I didn't. She's talking about the, the book of life and how our name's written in the book of life, right. but then there's a passage that talks about your name being blotted out. Okay. So. Okay, that passage is in the book of the Revelation, chapter 3, verse 7. To him that overcometh, him will I not blot out of the book of life. At the great white throne judgment, whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Everybody has their name in the book of life. Psalm 69, 25 says... Let them be blotted out of the living and not written with the righteous. God has two books. One is the book of life. The other is the Lamb's book of life. Everybody has their name in the book of life. But when they die without Christ, their name is blotted out. Sometimes even before. There is an unpardonable sin. But 
those that have the, that have been overcomers, he says, them will I not blot out. So when we get to heaven, there's a dual record. I had a sermon once. One of my men, I, I I'm going to shock you, preacher. I require all my deacons to preach from the pulpit. <laughs> and so one of the deacons, he worked as a uh, bookkeeper, and he didn't know what to do. And so I helped him a little bit. And he brought a wonderful message, and I got a message out of it. And that was on the bookkeeping system that they had, had a backup. Well, the Bible says you cannot be judged for death except there be two or three witnesses. So God has to have a backup. Now, the backup are the two books. You're blotted out of one and not written in the other. Or your name is not blotted out and it's in the Lamb's book of life. So there can be no mistakes. At the great white throne judgment, somebody might say, yeah, but I was a deacon in the church or I was a preacher. You know, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but they that do the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? That's preachers. Have we not cast out devils in thy name? That's miracle workers. Have we not done many wonderful things in thy name? That's all of Christianity. And then he said, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. They hadn't lost it. They just didn't have it in the first place. So God has a perfect record keeping system in the two books. It can be blotted out of the book of life. But once it's in the Lamb's book of life, it cannot be blotted out. Hopefully that answers that question. <laughs> Can you elaborate on the unpardonable sin? That's a difficult question. Deuteronomy 29, 29 answers it. Secret things belong unto the Lord. <laughs> but, but there is some indication in the Bible. And I have found that the only ones in the Bible that committed the unpardonable sin were very religious leaders. Very religious leaders. And I don't think the average person would ever qualify like that, but they condemned the Lord. They attributed unto Christ the things he was doing, they attributed to the devil. That was an unpardonable sin. See, it's the Holy Ghost. And so, really, I can't answer the question. That's a secret one belongs to the Lord. But there is some indication. And I have found that only very religious people could commit that. And that would be those false prophets that we find in 2 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 5, where he talks about Satan's churches, talks about the Lord's church, and no marvel for Satan himself shall turn himself into a uh, representative of light and so his servants. So... We have a couple more. Miss Judy. I have just one more. Okay. As Nancy said about the, the war, about the war stuff or that, what about an, another awakening? Do you see any prophecies telling that there could be another awakening before? Could there be another awakening before? We know that the, the timing and everything that God's saying, but before there, the scriptures say anything about awakening that could happen before that? I can't find it in the Bible. I find everything is going to get worse. And I can say as a preacher of many, many years that I have watched the decline of Christianity like it's never had before. Right. The hundreds of years before, Christianity was so strong. But in the last century... And now, as we get closer and closer to the end, I find churches, half of the Christians don't even come to church on Sunday night. What's wrong with that half? Is it they're not really true Christians, or is it that they just, they're Christians that are like Israel, just falling away, following after other things? I'd rather watch the ball game on television. But they don't come out. Now, only God knows the answer. You know, it's found in Matthew seven twenty one, 
the answer. And uh, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord. But we've watched the decline. A lot of churches, and I'm sorry to say this, a lot of churches that I've been going to lately, lately have quit having Sunday night services. They've quit having Wednesday night services. And I say, well, the reason is the preacher's lazy. I put the blame on the preacher. I've been one of them. <laughs> and the blame's on me too. But you know, we can't give in to the people. We're not here to please the people. We've got to keep it, keep it going. Really keep it going. Don't give up. And don't moderate. Be as firm at the end as you were in the beginning. Okay, I better hush up. <laughs> Isn't this a lot of fun, though? Do you want some more? No. He's asking when you backslide and you've gotten away from God, can you fall so far that God kicks you to the side? Now, give me that last part again. Can you fall or backslide so bad that God just kicks you to the side where God stops using you? Yeah. You know, we have so much in the Bible about assurance. You can backslide. Man, I remember when I did. (laughs) But the Lord brought me back, and he will. Now, for those of you that have children that sometimes you're disappointed in, they backslide and get away. God has a way of bringing them back, and he will. You just trust him, keep praying for them. But there's so much in the Bible about assurance. Sure, you can backslide, and you can get a long ways away from God. Let me give you an example. Peter, warming himself by a fire, cursed and says, I don't even know that man, Jesus. He was pretty backslidden. But the Lord knew it and had a job for him. And he says, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And boy, he became a master, didn't he? Such a wonderful preacher. He said, traveling over the last five, ten years, he said, in the churches you've seen, what kind of decline have you seen? What's the good and bad that you've seen in the churches? Well, there are some wonderful, wonderful churches. And uh, there are other churches that have been wonderful, wonderful churches, and something has happened. For example, the Akron Baptist Temple. I used to preach in the Akron Baptist Temple when they were running four and five thousand. The Akron Baptist Temple has now been sold for $3 million, valued at $8 million. They've changed their name. They're no longer a Baptist church. They're the bridge, whatever that means. They're running about 400. They can't pay the bills. Now, what has happened? Well, preachers, if they're not careful, can come in and make a lot of changes too fast. Now, a lot of times changes are necessary, and I'm not opposed to change, but you need to work it in very carefully and very slowly. Now, some of these that I used to go to, just great churches, they're no longer hardly in existence. All the big churches, Dr. Tom Malone held five meetings for Tom Malone, and now the church is just a handful. The building they had is all locked up. The school, Midwestern Baptist College. I used to teach there when they had three or four hundred. Now the school's in a church and there's just a handful. But what happens? It's really leadership and it's, uh, oh, I don't know. I guess it's trying to live like somebody else. When you try to be somebody else, you can't do it. You've got to be yourself. And so many... Churches want to 
imitate other churches, what makes them great? Well, let me tell you, there's no such thing as a big church and a little church in God's sight. The church is a body. Now, I'm a body, just about worn out, but I still like that little finger. It's not very big, but it's part of the body. It's part of making the whole thing work. You can't fire a gun without that thumb. You can't hold a sword. You can't run if you lose your big toe. Every part of the body is just as important as the other. So there's no such thing as a big church or a little church. Every church is part of the body of Christ. And some preachers get discouraged. They come to me and and want me to help them and encourage them, and I try. But, you know, we have to use the talents that we have. And some have more talents than others. And to whom much is given, much is required. So it balances out. If he doesn't have a whole lot, it's just as equal as the one that has a lot if he's using it to its maximum. Okay, I better shut up. <laughs> Pre- preacher didn't know what he was getting into on this question and answer business. <laughs> Let, let's do one more while we, we have time. Go ahead, Matt. Genesis 6, it talks about the uh, sons of God coming down and having offspring with the daughters of men. Who do you think the sons of God were? All right, in Genesis 6, when the sons of God came down and have offspring, who were the, who were this, who were the sons of God in Genesis 6? Well, that's Deuteronomy 29, 29. <laughs> but, but, there were giants in those days. And, uh, a lot of people and preachers, I don't speculate, I try not to, but a lot of people speculate that those were fallen angels that came down and had children with the daughters of men. And so I can't answer it for sure. There's some things that we're not going to know, but there's that possibility. There's that, because there were giants in the land in those days. Sorry about that. <laughs> Preacher, could you answer that? No, sir. I <laughs> do. <laughs> I have a question. And this, we'll end with this one just because I was, I was curious. I didn't want to take away from anybody else. So in prophecy, uh, in the New Testament, when it talks about in the last days, uh, the young men would dream dreams. And you know what I'm talking about in that passage where it says all that stuff was going to happen and they would prophesy and all that. What is that talking about? Well, Proverbs twenty nine twenty nine. <laughs> but uh, in the last days, now in the Old Testament, they had visions, they had dreams, because they didn't have the written word completed. The Bible says, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. We're not living in a time of visions and things like that now. I've had people say, well, I had a vision and God talked to me. God's never talked to me. Now, He's spoken to my heart, laid things on my heart. When God lays something on my heart, I do it. But He's never spoken to me in in an audible voice. I've never had a vision. I've had lots of dreams, mostly bad. (laughs) But uh, I'm doubtful of what some of these claim they have. For example, we have one in uh, Oklahoma claims that he saw Christ and he was 80 feet tall. You know, I kind of doubt that. (laughs) But he has a great following. 